If you remember back to last month, where we're looking at what Swedenborg describes as thinking spiritually or thinking like an angel, and we're learning to do it, and learning that in actual fact we already do it to some extent without realising that we do so. And today we're talking about time. So I just want to share a general quote with you on this idea. The thoughts of angels are not limited and confined by ideas from space and time as human thoughts are. For spaces and times belong to nature, and the things that belong to nature withdraw the mind from spiritual things and deprive intellectual sight of its range. Now, if you remember the way I introduced um, this series last month, I talked about the journey. And of course, a journey is something that involves both space and time. And we talked about space as meaning state, state of being, and so you can see there's something related in here about time also as being a progression or a succession of state. So just as a journey is moving from one place to another, time is the progress of making that, that journey. So then elsewhere we read, angels have no notion or idea of time and space, not even knowing at all what time and space are. He goes on to say, a man thinks from time, but an angel thinks from state. Now, if you don't remember anything else today, I want you to remember that one. Okay? A man thinks from time, but an angel thinks from state. Now, we get a sense of this. If you've ever read any accounts of near-death experiences, one of the common occurrences is the time that someone spends in the spiritual world does not relate to the time that they are unconscious in this world. You know, someone might spend only a few minutes unconscious in this world and yet they've spent days, months, a, a long period of apparent time in the spiritual world in that very short natural world time. It's an idea that we find has moved across to C.S. Lewis's novel, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I don't know, I, I imagine you're all familiar with that work. And that at the end of the book, the four children, they, they become kings and queens of this kingdom of Narnia and they spend many years and in actual fact they grow up and become adults and then they go and find the, the wardrobe door again and, and wonder what it is, having forgotten, go back through the wardrobe door and they've become children once more. And now look, we're all familiar with the concept of the stretchiness of time. We've all experienced it, how time can drag or time can race depending upon the particular state that we're in. And it's often about whether we are or the way that we anticipate what is about to happen. So often if we are looking forward to a particular event or we're dreading a particular event that we know is coming up, that affects our perception of time in the here and now. But what I want you to do is just consider what's actually going on there. When we're anticipating a future event, what we're doing is we're imagining what it will be like at that future time and we kind of bring that state into our present state. And so that can prolong the experience of the present state now, anticipating what's coming, and that can be for better or worse, or it can make it seem to race. But then I want you to think about what happens when the anticipated event doesn't match your expectations. 
So we can be dreading something that's coming up, but then when it happens, we think, oh, that's not quite so bad as I thought, and we're pleasantly surprised, and then we can look back and think, well, I put myself through all of that torment because I was expecting the worst. You see, it's changed the state of the expectation, but it hasn't come to fruition in the way that I quite expected it to. On the other hand, we can also be deeply disappointed when we get there. Imagine an event that you are looking forward to. Great anticipation and how you feel looking forward to something. And then you get there and it happens and it kind of flops. It doesn't, it doesn't match expectations. Now, I've heard a statistic that, you know, more divorces happen immediately after Christmas than through the rest of the year. And I wonder whether part of this dynamic is the reason for this, that we, we build up to Christmas in such a way. We're so enthusiastic. We're looking forward to Christmas so much. And then something happens and it doesn't meet our expectations. And we bring that disappointment then into something that should have been a joyous event. So our anticipation of something brings something of a state into our present. Whether it actually is true of the event itself or it's merely what we've expected is, is up for grabs. But then memory also brings another time into our present. And, and memory, if you think about it, is not just the recollection of events. It's not just you thinking, oh yes, this happened and that happened. It's also the experience of that state. If you remember your mother, for example, who may have passed on many years ago, but you remember your mother and you don't just think, oh yes, that's my mother you remember the affection with, that you felt for her at the time you saw her. So it's more than just memory. We, we experience the state of being. All right, I want to show you a passage where this all began for me. And it was this one from Conjugal Love, Swedenborg talking about love in marriage. He wrote this, People who are in a state of truly conjugal love look to eternity in their marriage, while the opposite is the case with those who are not in a state of conjugal love. Now, what does it mean to look to eternity in your marriage? That was my question. What does it mean to look to eternity in your marriage? And what I concluded was, if you imagine yourself on your wedding day, did you ever imagine your marriage was going to end on your wedding day? No. On your wedding day, a lovely day, a celebration with family and friends, and, and a beginning of a marriage, no one looks to the end of their marriage. No one thinks, oh, it's going to end in 10 years or 15 years or whatever. And yet, one third of marriages do end in 10 or 15 years. But of course, on that, at that time, on that day, no one thinks about it. So for me, this idea of looking to eternity in your marriage gives you a sense of the state of your marriage in actual fact, here and now. So if you ever look forward to the end of your marriage, you know that your marriage right now is in trouble. But if that thought would give you grief, then you know that your marriage is, is probably pretty good and secure. That was, that was what I thought about. Now, Swedenborg goes on in this, um, this paragraph and he cites this example. On another occasion, I listened to, to two partners who one moment entertained a thought of eternity in respect to their marriage. It's never going to end. 
and the next moment a thought of it as something temporary. The reason was there was an internal dissimilarity existing between them. But then I think it's deeper than that again. Now I'm going to show you a fairly long passage from Divine Love and Wisdom and I'm going to go slowly through it because there's a lot of words and a lot of concepts and it can be difficult to get your head around but I think it's worth it. So just stick with me. The creation of the universe and all things of it cannot be said to have been wrought from space to space or from time to time, thus progressively and successively, but from eternity and infinity. Not from an eternity of time, because there is no such thing, but from an eternity not of time. And get your head around that for starters. Okay? So it's not from an eternity of time, because there's no such thing, but from an eternity not of time. For this is the same with the divine, nor from an infinity of space, because again, there is no such thing, but from an infinity not of space, which is also the same with the divine. Again, so I get that your head around that idea, an infinity not of space. And we'll go on. These things I know transcend the ideas of thoughts that are in natural light, but they do not transcend the ideas of thoughts that are in spiritual light. For in these there is nothing of space and time, Neither do they wholly transcend ideas that are in natural light, for when it is said that an infinity of space is not possible, this is affirmed by everyone from reason. It is the same with eternity, for this is an infinity of time. If you say to eternity, it is compre comprehensible, but from eternity is not comprehensible unless time is removed. And just dwell on that last little phrase. If you say to eternity it is comprehensible, but from eternity is not comprehensible unless time is removed. So what I want to do then is go back to conjugal love. A little further in the same paragraph where Swedenborg writes, People who are in a state of truly conjugal love look to eternity in their marriage because eternity is inherent in this love. And remember the idea of an eternity not from time. An eternity not from time. What we're talking about is not watching the clock, it's talking about spiritual states of love and wisdom. And when we are in states of love and wisdom, there's no end to them. They just are. Okay, I'm going to go and just talk about two issues and I'm going to go back to our Bible passages that we read earlier this morning. I want to talk about the Sabbath and I want to talk about innocence and guilt. Now think about the Sabbath. Does the specific day actually matter in celebrating the Sabbath? Does the specific day actually matter? Imagine if we got it wrong. Imagine, you know, imagine the Lord had created the world in seven days but then we actually got it wrong. Somewhere we lost a day. If the day actually mattered, then we'd just be wrong. We'd have the day wrong. Now, it doesn't take you too long when you start investigating things like changes of calendar, 
when you start investigating the fact that some cultures didn't have a seven-day week, did you realise some cultures had a ten-day week? Interesting, isn't it? The day itself doesn't matter. It would be ridiculous, actually, to say that it matters that Sunday is Sunday is Sunday. So we need to look at something beyond the day itself, rather to what it's pointing to. In Isaiah chapter 58 we have these words, If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, so that you do not do your own will on my holy day, but call the Sabbath delights honourable to the holiness of Jehovah, and honour it, so that you do not do your own ways, nor find your own desire, or speak your own words, then you will take delight in Jehovah, and I will convey you into the high places of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. And Swedenborg writes about that. Anyone who is acquainted with the internal sense of the word can see plainly that the Sabbath here is used to mean a state in which a person is joined to the Lord. Thus a state where the person is led by the Lord and not by self. That is a state which exists when good resides in him. So the Sabbath day is representative of the state of being joined to the Lord and that is what matters. Now, of course, we realise as well that our joining to the Lord can't just happen on one day in the week. It has to happen through the entire week for Sunday to mean anything. And that's a very important point for us to note. The last thing I want to mention is innocence and guilt. And this reflects on the Ezekiel passage we read this morning. Our concept of innocence and guilt is bound up with time. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but it's bound up with time. So we measure a person's likelihood to carry out a particular crime based on their history. So we think of children as innocent, but one of the reasons we think of children as innocent is because they've never committed a crime. They haven't done anything bad. They've got no, nothing against their, you know, nothing, no but black ticks against their name. I have in my wallet a working with vulnerable people card. Or you might, if you volunteer, go and have a police check which says that you are a suitable person to work with the elderly or work with children. On what basis? on the basis that you've never been convicted of a crime against those people. So our sense of innocence and guilt is bound up with time. Cast your minds back a few weeks and you will remember that, um, that latest school massacre, school shooting that took place in Texas, in Uvalde. And you will remember, once again, the US has gone through this process of calling for greater gun reform. And one of the reforms that they have proposed is the idea of having background checks for, to purchase certain types of firearms. But even in amongst all of that, you still have the acknowledgement that in this particular case, in regard to the Uvalde shootings, such checks would not have made any difference because the young man who was concerned on that particular day was not on anybody's radar. He'd committed no crimes. He had nothing against his name which would have prevented him buying those firearms. And you can see the shortcomings of our ideas of innocence and guilt based on time. Now the law even recognises this because you have such a thing in this state as the spent convictions scheme. So a spent convictions scheme means that after a certain period of time with no further, um, no further crimes being committed, 
things that are on your criminal record can no longer be counted against you. So the law even recognises this issue. But we have no way around it. It is the only measure that we have of innocence or guilt. What we have to realise is innocence and guilt are actually about my present state of being, they're not about my history. So a person who has committed a crime can not commit a crime here and now. They can be reformed. And a person who has never committed a crime can commit a crime here and now because they can be in the state that is capable of doing so. And so in Ezekiel we talked about, you know, a, um, a history of, of wickedness does not condemn a righteous man. And a history of righteousness does not, con does not save a wicked one. It's what you're capable of here and now that matters. All right, what are we going to learn from all of this? When we're talking about time, we're talking about state of being. Understanding the past and the future is very useful to us. But what is even more useful is to understand our spiritual states that we have passed through, that we are in now. So, for example, the idea of learning I wonder if you've heard the phrase, um, those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But here's the thing, our history only determines our future to the extent that the states that ruled us in the past still rule us now. So it's the states we were in as compared to the states we are in now. That's what matters. And then of course it's possible to learn without history. Do you realise that as well? And Swedenborg talks about an easier kind of repentance and this is what he says. When we are considering doing something evil and are forming an intention to do it, we say to ourselves, I am thinking about this and I am intending to do it, but because it is a sin, I am not going to do it. So we don't need a history of mistakes to learn and to get better. We can think it through first. And then we have the idea of planning and progress as well. When we are working towards some goal, it's important for us to work towards it positively. As an example, we can get very tied up in knots about the fact that we're a small group. And, and in doing so, we we kind of take a small group attitude with us in our planning and our activity. One of the things that I always think about with small groups is every group in the world, whatever size it was, at one point in its history was a small group. You think about Apple Computer. Apple Computer is one that I love. That started with two guys in a, in a garage. Okay? They started as a small group. Did it worry them that they were a small group? No, it didn't. They had a vision. And they brought that attitude of vision to the work they were doing now. And that's one way that we cannot be dictated by our history, but be at look towards something and work towards something in the future. And it's all about that attitude that we can use this idea of time positively.